Britain's longest reigning monarch, has passed away. Her Majesty, the Queen Elizabeth II, has of course died at the age of 96 years old in Balmoral Castle in Scotland after her magnificent 70-year reign. Hello and welcome to the channel. I am That One History G and if you have seen my videos before, you'll know that I talk about history. I do not presume to be a commentator or pundit on royalty or anything for that matter, actually. I am simply looking to tell you the facts. I look at them and share them with you. Now, before we get started, remember to like, comment and subscribe, please, if you haven't done so yet. Now, this is obviously one short video and I cannot possibly recount 96 years of a person's life, so I definitely will not attempt to do so. We will, however, in this video, look at some highlights of her life, and we will look what will happen in her funeral and what is likely to happen for the future of the monarchy. So, let's get into this. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth was born on the 21st of April 1926 to the Duke and Duchess of York. Her life journey had just begun, but her beginnings weren't as you would expect. Her father was known as Bertie to the family, and he was actually the second born son to George V and Mary of Teck. George V became king because his elder brother and heir to the throne, Prince Albert, died before him. By the way, Elbert was actually engaged to Mary of Teck before his death. However, George V's father, Edward VII, decided that his next son, George V, should marry Teck. Anyway, Mary of Teck, of course. So, the likelihood of Queen Elizabeth II becoming queen from the very beginning seemed pretty slim. So how did she actually become queen? Now bear with me, it is a little bit complicated to explain. The only reason for her father, George VI, becoming king was because his elder brother, Edward, fell in love with a twice-divorced woman called Wallace Simpson. Edward did, however, become king when his father, George V, died in 1936. But Edward, now known as Edward the Eighth insisted on being with Wallace Simpson, and in the Church of England, which he headed, divorce is a no-no. Obviously, him being the head of the church meant that he was forced to choose between his love or his throne. He famously chose love and abdicated his throne, meaning that his brother, his younger brother, the Duke of York, Queen Elizabeth's father, became King George the Sixth, and Elizabeth was the eldest child of the monarch, therefore she was the heir to the throne. However, if he had a son, she would go down in the rankings, go down in the line of succession. But, of course, he didn't have a son. Therefore, Queen Elizabeth was the first heir, first in the line to the throne. Elizabeth grew up in a sheltered environment with governesses and tutors teaching her and not going to school, which is a fact she hated for the rest of her young adult life because she felt like she didn't actually know anything. So she ensured that her children and all the rest of her grandchildren would go to normal schools. During World War II, she even studied as a mechanic in the auxiliary territorial services, meaning the likelihood of her actually seeing action were zero, but she still got in the swing of things for World War II. When she became heir presumptive, she didn't automatically become the Princess of Wales, which is often used as the title for the heir. In fact, she never became the Princess of Wales, because the king or queen needs to create their heir as Prince or Princess of Wales. In other words, they need to give them the title. George VI didn't do this for Elizabeth. Elizabeth was simply known as Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth until she married a Greek prince who was forced to denounce his titles and was made the Duke of Edinburgh by her father, King George VI. I am, of course, talking about Prince Philip, Queen Elizabeth's second cousin, once removed through Christian IX of Denmark, and third cousin through Queen Victoria. The pair met on many family occasions, but according to the Queen, they really hit it off when she was 13 years old when she went to the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth, and Philip was training there. But he was 17 years old then. 
Nonetheless, the pair married in 1947. It was actually the first time the country felt that it could really celebrate as a country as it came out of the post-World War II lull. The pair were a resounding success. They went from royal tour to public event to royal tour. And in October 1951, she, the Queen, Princess Elizabeth back then, was on her way to a royal tour of Australia and New Zealand via Kenya. She was, however, informed in Kenya by Philip that her father, a heavy smoker, George VI, had died from lung cancer. The very second George VI breathed his last breath, even though Elizabeth was thousands of kilometers away and unaware of what had happened, she became queen. Not just queen, but the queen regent, the sovereign of the largest empire in the known world at that time, a place where the sun never sets and heavy is the head that wears the crown. We have a queen, but there was an issue. The issue is whether the Royal House of Windsor, the name of Windsor, would actually carry on. See, there was a tradition that the Royal House would fall under the highest male in the kingdom. That was, of course, Philip, who changed his name from his father's Danish and Greek Royal House, Glücksburg, to Mount Batten, which was an English adaptation forced upon a German princely house of Battenberg, where his mother came from. Interestingly enough, the House of Windsor only came into existence in 1917 when George V changed the name of the royal house from the German house, Saxe, Coburg and Gotha, during World War I, when the UK and Germany were at war with one another. In the end, however, Windsor would remain as the name for the royal house of the UK, but all male line descendants of the Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip without royal styles or titles since 1970 have been using the surname Mountbatten Windsor whenever there is a surname required from them, which isn't often. The Queen was coronated on the 2nd of June 1953 at Westminster Abbey, an ancient ceremony where the Queen is not only crowned, puts a crown on her head, and the royal jewels are used, but she is anointed by God with holy oil. In front of 8,000 people from all around the world, it was once the most televised event in history. However, she wouldn't be coronated as Queen and Empress like all British monarchs had been done since Queen Victoria because her empire had slowly transformed into a commonwealth of nations. From here on out, she would rule her constitutional monarchy with steadfast willingness and an eager eye. Not going to go much into her 70 years reign because we would be here for a mighty long time. I will talk about some highlights though. She and Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, went on to have four children. The eldest child, now King Charles III, the Princess Royal Anne, the Duke of York Andrew, and the youngest son, the Earl of Wessex, Edward. Edward is expected to gain his father's title, the Duke of Edinburgh in the next few months. Note it is only September 2022. The Queen has just died. As decolonization rightfully accelerated in the 1960s and 70s, it was the Queen that was sent out to the countries to help them transfer their independence peacefully and to join the Commonwealth of Nations by offering favorable economic ties to Britain. But she, of course, is just a symbol. She has no real political power. She even visited the communist country of Yugoslavia in 1972, being the first British monarch to ever do so. Then there was Australia in 1975, when it went through a constitutional crisis and politicians tried to lure the Queen in to dismiss their opposition, but she held strong to her one and only constitutional right of staying out of politics. In 1981, during the Trooping of the Colour Ceremony, six blank shots were fired at the Queen whilst she was riding in the procession. The 17-year-old that fired the blank shots was sentenced to a five-year imprisonment, but the Queen was praised for being composed and calm while controlling her mount. A few weeks later, she was witness to her eldest son Charles and Diana Spencer's marriage. In the same year, on the royal tour in Dunedin, New Zealand, she was met with another 17-year-old who fired at her from the fifth floor of a building that overlooked a parade. Luckily, he missed and he was sentenced to prison for three years. However, after two years of that sentence, he tried to escape 
and assassinate the Prince Charles and Princess Diana of Wales with their newborn son, Prince William. Now this next section of scandal and difficulties from the burning of the Windsor Castle, her annus horribilis, the divorce of their children, the death of Princess Diana all the way to her grandson Harry's tell-all interview is rather well known by all and I feel a section that can be told by the tabloid press and not me. In February 2022, she had her platinum jubilee which marked her 70-year rule as the longest reigning monarch in British history. A few short months later, after slowly receding away from public life, her reign came to a close two days after appointing her 15th British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, to pass away in her Scottish castle, Belmoral, in the afternoon of the 8th of September. From that very moment, just like she did when her father died, her heir, Charles, became king. From that moment on, Operation London Bridges Down was set into action. The direct royal family were informed of her death. Then her private secretary informed the prime minister who informed the members of parliament who informed the 15 realms where the queen was the head of state and the 38 commonwealth countries. From there, the BBC were informed and they announced her death at 6.30 p.m. UK time, which was the start of a 10 day mourning period. No sport is to be played in the country. Her body is currently being taken around the UK and will be brought down from Scotland to London on the 15th of September, where her body will lay in state until her funeral on the 19th of September. In the meanwhile, her son and heir will go through his proclaiming as King of the United Kingdom. Charles III, after 70 years of being first in line to the throne, the longest heir to any throne ever. On Monday, the 19th of September, the Queen's state funeral will be held in Westminster Abbey with her family following behind her. After the funeral, the body will be taken to Windsor Castle where she will be buried in St. George's Chapel near Prince Philip. Now, there are, of course, some talks about why there is still a constitutional monarchy around today in this day and age. Monarchy is simply the oldest form of government in the United Kingdom. In a monarch, a king or queen is head of state away from the skirmish of politics. The British monarchy is known as a constitutional monarchy. This means while the sovereign, the head of state, is able to make and pass laws, she or he doesn't elect these laws. They are elected by an electoral parliament, the people that the actual population elect. Although the sovereign is no longer a politician and only has an executive role, he or she continues to play an important part in the life of a nation. As head of state, the monarch undertakes constitutional and representative duties which have developed over a thousand years of history. In addition to these state duties, the monarch has a less formal role, the head of nation. The sovereign acts as a focus for national identity unity, pride. It gives us a sense of stability and continuity. Officially, they recognize success and excellence and support the idea of voluntary service. These people, these heads of state, are above politics. They ensure the nation's culture continues and they are one for tradition. They cannot be tempted by corruption because they are already at the top of the pile, so they can only seek for the betterment of a nation. Moreover, one may ask, why on earth should you pay for them? Well, it costs each British person £1.29 pence for their working royals each year, but they bring in £19 billion pounds every single year to Britain's economy, so it actually makes economic sense to keep them. The king or queen is the king or queen of a son, and King Charles has had the greatest opening act anyone could ever follow. He has, however, had 70 years of experience and has already been dubbed the climate change king. As the saying goes, the queen is dead. Long live the king. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you want to watch in the future by commenting down below. Like, comment, and subscribe. The more you know.